are these people? We're going to talk about a article um, that is referencing a doctor's account in Gaza. Um, so it's going to be a bit rough, but we're going to get through it. Um, I think it's important to showcase these kind of things. So this is out of Sheer Pros. Uh, Catherine Mullaly, I guess that's how you pronounce that. Uh, oh. She writes, war surgery is not peace surgery. An American doctor in Gaza. So, um, Dr. Feroz Sidva is a 42-year-old critical care and trauma surgeon based at San Joaquin, Joaquin. Joaquin Phoenix, Joaquin. Joaquin Phoenix General Hospital, a level two trauma center in San Joaquin <coughs> County, California. He arrived in Southern Gaza in March, carrying thousands of rolls of paper tape, Carolic uh, bandage wraps and medicated zero-form gauze, tools of his trade. What bullets and shrapnel had vaporized in Gaza, Dr. Sidwa would do his very best with a scalpel and medicated cotton to save what was left behind. From California to Cairo, an eight-hour bus trip across the Sinai with Palestinian American Medical Association, a.k.a. PAMA colleagues, Dr. Sidwa and the others arrived at the Rafa border crossing where they entered Gaza on March 25th. It was dark after sundown and unexpectedly quiet. His first sight of Gaza European Hospital in Khan Yunus is an outdoor square called the Madan, a five-minute walk from the main hospital into the chair room, a converted COVID isolation space near the Madan with six other men. Um, the room was filthy and fly-infested, as he later described his place to sleep and where he would gauge the advancing proximity of Israeli Defense Forces bombardments. As he exited the van at the Madan, he was it was the children, short and malnourished, who greeted him first with, Hello! They cried, asking for sweets and chocolate. The courtyard was their living room. Dr. Sidwa was interviewed during his stay at the hospital for about two weeks in March, and afterward by phone and email. Additionally, he sent rented, written an audio text message to me, that's Catherine, right? Detailing the situation regularly from Gaza. This article is composed of all of these communications, we met as graduate students in global health and international humanitarian law at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health in 2009. We agreed that I would write the story before he went to Gaza on May 18th. Some foreign doctors volunteering at the hospital were evacuated from Gaza after being stuck there when Israeli invaded Rafa, the southernmost city of the enclave, this month. For Dr. Sidwa and his group, hospital orientation began in the four intensive care units. One postperoperative, one cardiac, although without elective heart surgeries, this cardiac was in name only. One pediatric and a repurposed endoscopy space for a total of 24 intensive care beds. Right? So, nice. scan scanning the beds and the CT images, Dr. Sidwa quickly realized there were three tracks of ICU patients. First, the bullet wound patient, most often to the head, who are often intubated and unresponsive. Second, the post-explosive patients with exposed and broken bones and external rods poking out from under their sheets. Third were the DKA patients, type 1 diabetics in coma hovering state. In wartime, the Gaza European Hospital was filled with civilian post-explosive trauma patients and insulin-dependent diabetics. The DKA patients were unexpected. To survive, they require regular insulin. Insulin requires refrigeration. In Gaza, with over 1.7 million people displaced, there's no outpatient insulin because nobody has a house anymore. They can't refrigerate anything, Dr. Sidwa told me. In Gaza, diabetics have become sentinel patients, the canaries of the coal mine, he added, and a visible reminder of the critical failures amid this unrelenting humanitarian so just uh, for those in the chat, uh, DKA yeah. stands for Diabetics Related Ketoacetosis. So basically, okay. it's yeah, it's a condition that Diabetic affects coma. people with diabetes, and if you don't, or if you've been diagnosed. So yeah, just for people in the chat uh, who who missed that, understood. So. Dr. Sidwa got to work right away and messaged me by WhatsApp his progress on March 26th, writing, 
did four X laps today, an exploratory laparotomy, opening a belly to see if there's an injury inside. All in children, all from explosive weapon. One also got a crany, a craniotomy, an operation to remove skull bone to see if there's an injury inside. And one got an X-fix, an external fixator, metal rods fixed on the outside of the body to hold broken bones in place. All of them were wounded hours before arrival since they had to be extracted from rubble. The Gaza European Hospital was founded by the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees in the Near East, a.k.a. UNRWA in 1989, and is estimated to have 200 beds and more than 500 staff. The numbers were hard to verify for Dr. Sidwell, but what he did know was that patient numbers had exploded. While medical, nursing, and staff resources had been eaten up, systems were non-existent, and what little untrained staff remained were exhausted. A tent city had sprung up around the hospital without the water facilities or a shelter to support such a displaced person's camp. In a WhatsApp voice message, Dr. Sidra described the scene on one of his many walks to and from the Medan. It's just squalor everywhere. Everything is disgusting. Tents on both lines, sides, densely lined. Seven, eight, nine, ten people living in each one. Some of them are made out of tarp. Some of them are actual camping tents. A lot of them have, you know, a lot of these are sewn together from sacks of flour. He added, I'm walking by the four latrines that people share here. I'm told there's 20,000 people on this, on the hospital grounds, and they share Ugh. four latrines. You can imagine the smell, and it's literally right in front of the hospital main entrance, which is also a giant city. Ugh. So there's there's Dr. Sidwa on the left, right? Oh, well, as well as his, his colleagues, right? So that was the van they left to, to go to Rafa. So... Dr. Sidwa saw that the tents were numbered, saying, I hadn't noticed it before, but every tent actually has a number and a designation on it. There was a WhatsApp tracking system to see who needed food, who was disabled, so that they would not be forgotten. Despite the many displacements and trauma, people around the hospital wanted to stay together as families. That preference was exposed in the emergency room mass casualty events every night. Amid ongoing bombardments and explosives, Whole families were killed or injured together. One week, on March 31st, Dr. Sidwa sent a WhatsApp voice message from Gaza after experiencing one such night on call. He says, last night we had another mass casualty event. This time, literally 100% of the patients were women and children. There was a mom who had just some minor wounds. Thankfully, she was fine. Her son was on the bed with her, three years old. He ended up having blood around his lung from a shrapnel injury that had to be drained. He had a shrapnel injury to the head as well. Hopefully, it will not be too bad. As long as his brain doesn't swell badly, he should be okay with it. His mother had to watch blood pour out of her child's chest and was completely stoic about it. Totally nuts, Dr. Sidwa said, adding, She stroked his hair as we put in the tube. He described another child, and then there was another young girl, probably six or seven years old. I think she was that mother's only ch other child. She had a bunch of lacerations, really all over her body, but thankfully, nothing like threat. She'll have to deal with wound infection and stuff like that for a while. This tidal back-and-forth description between near death and hope was a signature imprint from Dr. Sidwa's WhatsApp text and voice communications. Sorry, I'm walking through the hallways, he said. In another voice message, probably can hear there's people everywhere here. It's impossible to find a quiet place in Gaza. Right now. Without the hospital's ICUs filled with head injuries, long bone fractures, and patients in DKA, the wards filled with the civilian war wounded. Dr. Sid will walk the wards and was met with cries of doctor and with quick bedside consults, determined that all the patients needed surgical repair. Every time you go on the ward, you walk around and people just come up to you and say, doctor, 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 look at this, look at this, look at this. And I mean, literally every single time. It's like, oh, that needs surgery, that needs surgery, and that needs surgery too. 
Despite building collapses, there were few crush injury patients in the emergency room trauma bay because the crush didn't make it in. The most common living injured patients had post-explosive extremity injuries, arms missing, legs missing. Most of Dr. Sidwa's trauma patients were women and children. The emergency room remained a steady stream of human trauma day after day, night after night. Dr. Sidwa's stay, an early post-call voice message, was sent to me on March 29th. It says, had a big mass casualty event last night. Apparently a building with a hundred people in it was destroyed. Had a seven-year-old girl with a blast wave injury that gave her right pneumonia, a right pneumo, right? Pneumothorax, collapsed lung, and a bad left pulmonary, right? So contusion. She'll leave if we don't have any delayed presentation abdominal injuries, but they often do. Her twin sister was buried under the rubble right next to her, but was thankfully fine other than cuts and bruises. Her sister had a right hemonumo, right? Another collapsed lung and a depressed uh, skull fracture with a bad TBI had to be <coughs> intubated. But if she doesn't have DAI, diffuse axonal injury, she could recover, had several depressed open skull fractures, most with small associated bleeds, and most of them were actually awake and talking. Two children arrived dead. They both looked less than two years old, and an old woman died as well, probably early 70s. War surgery is not peace surgery, and broken bones in war from blasts or penetrating missiles are dirty, as surgeons call it. They require repeated cleaning out of the dead tissue, as well as metal rod scaffolding outside the body to secure the bones until the muscles and soft tissue heal. After surviving death or amputation, broken bones and war require grafting, reconstruction, and rehabilitation, a grueling road. And how are they going to get that? Yeah, uh, bro. Like... Although the war wounded littered the hospital's wards, finding patients and getting surgical time was not always easy for Dr. Sidwa. The emergency room was run by volunteer medical students, and the surgeons who were left were overwhelmed. Surgical residents were left to perform their work without supervision. Paper charts and surgical plans were often lost or not communicated. Many surgeries happened at, ni at night after iftar when the daily fasts of Ramadan were broken. Even the calendar conspired against these patients, the doctor said. We found a young girl, four years old, on the ward today. He texted on March 30th. There's an acronym here. She's a WCNSF. It means wounded child, no surviving family. The girl's legs were so severely injured that there's about a three-inch portion of her femur missing, a giant necrotic wounds on both of her buttocks and the back of her left thigh, Maggots growing, and it is terrible. She was taken to the operating room and worked on for three hours. She survived. The longer Dr. Sid was stayed, the more the bombardments increased. The morning of April 1st, he left a voice message. The explosions are definitely getting more frequent around the hospital and seem like they're getting closer. None of the Palestinians are even remotely concerned, <coughs> so they must not actually be close. You can smell the explosives in the air, and the debris and the dust actually gets into your eyes while you're walking around now. And we're losing water and electricity more often, and the sewer system flooded over yesterday, which I guess isn't surprising when 12,000 people are occupying this basement for 600. But thankfully, the OR is still functioning, and we can still keep working. So Dr. Sidwa kept operating, and he texted on April 4th, Last night, also did a loop colostomy, bowel opening diverted to the abdominal wall on a nine-year-old girl who's the size of a five-year-old to divert away from her terrible buttock wound. She has some of the worst injuries I've ever seen in a child that size who wasn't dead. Her name is Jewelry. She was injured in a bombing where her mom and dad weren't at home. They were out, she said, and all of her seven siblings were injured and brought to Kuwati Special Hops hospital where her mom stayed and her dad was with Jory at Gaza European Hospital. He's just so in love with this little girl, Dr. Sidwa said. Finally, once these wounds were debrided and her sepsis went away, she went from being this like meek, terrified child to going to being like this spunky nine-year-old and she's like, 
started demanding chocolate and honey melon any time she was going to get more debridement. And so her poor dad had to go out and try to find honey melon, adding, we started giving him chocolate for her when she woke up so we didn't have to. Dr. Sidwell left a voice message as he walked toward the Medan, hearing what had become a branded background beat to this conflict, the buzz of ubiquitous overhead drones. These drones overhead right now, he sent a message. It was unexpected, noisy mix of whirring drones overhead and babbling children at play on the ground below. I don't know if you can hear them. I'm walking outside over to the Medan where I stay, but you know, the drones, they're constantly overhead. Like literally 100% of the time. The blast grew closer. Today was the first day that we felt blasts that actually shook the hospital. I haven't been able to read the news here because the internet connection is terrible, but I'm guessing the Israeli front's getting closer, but I have no idea, he said. But yeah, today the blast from whatever military hardware it was, I realized it could actually be felt in the hospital. That was the first time, even indoors, you can feel the pressure change. You know, your ears pop slightly, not terribly, but they, the ears pop, you notice it all of a sudden. You kind of catch your breath for no reason. Then, then you feel it. So, before I play this, anything you want to add, Kibber? Um, yeah. It, so, I do appreciate you reading this. I think, obviously, given we don't get a lot of on the ground. Yeah. Uh, perspectives of what's happening in Gaza right now. So to hear from this doctor, this American-based doctor, I think, is helpful. But it gives Giant what... perspective. Like... Yeah, but I think in terms of no water, barely. Mm -hmm. No internet, barely. Which kind of makes sense because if Israel is kind of doing a sneak attack... You know, they don't want to give any indication of what their movements are. So they're going to cut off these things so that you don't have access to the news. You don't have access to the Internet. Well, to anything out in the outside world to kind of help you determine if something is going to go down that might help you to kind of prepare yourself. So you basically are left to your instincts and pray to God that hopefully that, you know, that people are not dying on you like every single day. But the, the idea that this is happening, well, given what he's saying, mostly children. Yeah, and women. I think. And elderly. And women. Uh, children. Yeah. Like, is is very sad. And this is... And this is what, as I said in the last segment, that people are denying, oh, it's not a genocide. Like, if this happened here, to this extent, people will not tolerate that. Mm -hmm. They would be demanding justice for, like, let's say if these were American kids. You know? But because these are Palestinian kids that again, with propaganda that we're kind of, like, shown, oh, they don't exist, they're meaningless, that this is happening and it's uh, continuing to happen on the basis of the West imperialism and how our corporate and financial interests are more interesting than the humanity of ensuring that these children, and I'm emphasizing children, are alive. Two-year-olds, four-year-olds, nine-year-olds. Like, I know some of you are out there with kids, and like, imagine you had to go take your child to an emergency room, something that severe, and then have to go into a war zone to pick up chocolate and melon for them just so that they could get through a day with some joy. Like, it's ridiculous that we're even, 
like pussyfooting around this problem. Like it should be dealt with, you know? So I brought one more video. Uh, this is a nurse uh, and she just got back from Rafa, right? And this is, this is her, you know, discussing what she went through there. So trained in I think she's trained in, trained in, in burn, burn care. care arrived home yeah. overnight after weeks treating patients injured in the war in Gaza. There is no there's no hand sanitizer, paper towels, no linen to put your patients on. So we would come into the ICU, find patients on these plastic sheets that are disintegrating. They're laying in pools of blood fluids, but nothing to change them on. People have explosive injuries and we're giving them Tylenol. We're giving them ibuprofen for a, an arm that's been blown off or burns to 30% of their body. I mean, I, like, I don't know what else to say at this point, you know? I mean, it, trained in like, like Nikki Haley, and I said this on Twitter yesterday. Uh, like Nikki, Nikki Haley is getting a lot of heat in terms of her signing the shell, uh, a shell, um, saying "finish the job," which you can do, you can argue she didn't mean necessarily like. Palestinians per se, she probably what she probably meant was finish the job in terms of freeing the hostages, the Israeli hostages, but it was still in bad taste, all the same. Yeah. You know, but we're complaining about her. And I said this like that's to be expected from a Republican. Like at least uh, like to me, it's it's no surprise that she was gonna write something like that, given that she's a Republican. Like, what's the excuse of Biden sending, sending the money for the shells in the first place? And then we had someone like Elizabeth Warren who was like, oh, we need to stop what's happening in Rafa when, bitch, you signed off on it. You the, voted for it. The fucking audacity to condemn anyone trying to resist this genocide is laughable at this point. Imagine what you would do to keep your child from being injured even in the slightest manner like these are people who would constantly tell me well if they even touch my kids you know like and how are you silent on this uh, it amazes like, me like teamwork in the chat then they don't have meds no there is no like ibuprofen tylenol it's not you're not supposed to treat that for like burn wounds or like body parts like blown off of your body so i i cannot imagine like it, what got me uh was the latrines because when i lived yeah. in africa i used the train out outhouse basically yeah um so they're fine but they're not meant to be used for like how many people said it was like foul in the thousands so i cannot imagine the stink honestly um because latrines are not meant to be used for that amount of people cramped in a very in a relatively small space so in between that and then just no there's no life there. It just sounds like little death in Rafa right now. But, you know, shout out to this doctor for kind of sharing his perspective on the ground. But honestly, I don't know how he would have made it through it without, like, going crazy. Like, if I was in that situation, I don't know what I would do, honestly. Like, I can't imagine being in those conditions and actually functioning, basically. Um, and not lose my mind. Um, but to not come back and not be angry.
like mm. just an intense anger of what we are complicit in and what we're kind of allowing to happen. Um, and I think this will go into it, and I think this will be even more significant given uh, the story I'm going to share after this. Uh, yeah. Just, you know, th this kind of story. Now, granted, this is on the ground, but these stories, you know, the Zionist lobby do not want people to know about or even talk about. So they're being suppressed. Something like this will be suppressed in the media. So we might be lucky if we get a story like this here and there uh, in mainstream media, but nothing where I would argue that is going to promote the kind of outrage that people are going to be just disgusted by it. I can mm. imagine, though, if it were like, if we are seeing, if you were seeing some of the things that we have seen, like over the weekend, seeing a decapitated child, baby, you know, like if we, if you show that on mainstream media, like, yeah, I'm sure there'll be a lot larger outrage, but because it's on social media, it's a lot easier to suppress or kind of deny oh this is Hamas or whatever um but yeah it just it just makes me really furious that this is a, that this these are the stories that people are outright either ignoring or just straight up denying for a narrative um in terms of shifting the blame onto essentially them that this is somehow their fault and and it's not yeah i mean it's just like my my anger is almost like run dry on it you know like i just I, at this point i'm hoping a foreign power intervenes that's what I'm hoping for, because clearly, like, we're not doing <laughs> shit about it. So, you know, here's hoping, but talking about these things is why we're demonetized, so you can go to codashv.com slash Indie News Network if you want to support our work. You can scan the QR code on your screen, or if you're in the live chat, you can press exclamation mark donate in the live chat and get our little Kofi link there. Um, you know, if you can't do that, just like, subscribe, share, comment, do all that stuff to help engagement. Trying to get to 2K, we're not that far off. I think we only need less than 50 of you to sign up, so please do that. And if you want to support us on other platforms, you can look in the description below for our link tree at indienews.network and follow us on Rockfin and Rumble.